Sushruta for Neat is now available on the Google Play Store. Try it out for free. Uh, good evening, everybody. Hearty welcome to Biology class by GKP. In continuation of the study of strategies for enhancement in food production. Now let us study something about fisheries. Fishery is an industry devoted to the catching, processing or selling of fish, shellfish or other aquatic animals. In fact, fisheries comes under what is called aquaculture. Aquaculture deals with culturing of all aquatic organisms, including plants, including all types of animals, whatever found in water. Pisciculture is mainly concerned with the rearing, growing, processing or selling of fishes. As I have mentioned in my last class, fisheries involves or includes shell fisheries and fin fisheries. Shell fisheries deals with all other aquatic organisms other than fishes, which have shells. Mainly this includes molluscs and aquatic arthropods, mainly crustaceans. A large number of human population is dependent on fish, fish products and other aquatic animals such as a prawn, crab, lobster, edible oyster, etc, etc for food. Here, prawn, crab, lobster, oysters, these come under shell fisheries. With regard to fisheries, also we come across freshwater fisheries and marine fisheries. Some of the freshwater fishes which are very common include katla, ruhu, and common carp. These katla, ruhu, and brigala, these are together called major carps. I shall tell you about them later. Some of the marine fishes that are eaten include hilsa, sardine, mackerel, Pomperates, etc. I hope some of you might have heard about sardine and mackerel. Very common in coastal belt. Called in a local languages. Bangada, Bhutai, Vishwita. Yes, sir. Have you heard about this? Yes, sir. Do you like Bangada or Bhutai? Or both? Bangada, sir. Bangre. Nadira. Yes, sir. Do you like them? Yes, sir. You know Bangre Bhutai? Yes, sir. I like it. Yeah. So, anyhow, these are the fishes which are most liked by fish eating individuals. Look here. So nice. Katla, Ruhu, Karp. Mrigala, silver carp, grass carp, etc. Yes? So, you do have these are some of the fishes which are used very much as food fishes. This is hilsa, another fish. Right? These are all the sardines. Is it Bhutai or Bangadai? Yes, Pita? Yes, sir. Bangda or Bhutai? Sir, Bangda. Bangda. 
Okay. So this is Bhutai. Mackerel. That is in the Tulu languages. That are two words. So this is a pomplate fish. So now you got to know the different types of edible fishes. Fish is has an important place in Indian economy. It promotes income and employment to millions of fishermen and farmers, particularly in the coastal states. For many, it is the only source of their livelihood. In order to meet the increasing demands on fisheries, different techniques have been employed to increase the production. For example, through aquaculture and pisciculture, we have been able to increase the production of aquatic plants and animals, both freshwater and marine. Find out the difference between pisciculture and aquaculture. As I told you, pisciculture includes only culturing of fishes. Aquaculture includes culturing of the fishes and other than fishes from other organisms and also it includes plant culture, aquatic plant culture. This has led to the development and flourishing of a fish industry and it has brought a lot of income to the farmers in particular and the country in general. Now, we should talk about Blue Revolution. Blue Revolution as being implemented along the same line as Green Revolution. What is Blue Revolution? Blue Revolution leads to enhanced production of fishes. What is White Revolution? What is White Revolution? Have you heard about White Revolution? The milk. Anyone? Oh. Massively increase of milk and its milk products. Yeah, it is increased, enhanced production of milk and milk products. That is white revolution. Now let us look into fishes. The culturing of aquatic organisms in freshwater, brackish, and marine environment is called aquaculture. Now you tell me what is brackish water? What is brackish water? Salty water. Yeah. Salty ground water. Where you come across? Is it a now you are replying? Yes, sir. What is where you come across them? Sir, that area is for what? Pardon? Yes. Near estuaries. Who is telling this? Sir, it's Vismita. Pardon? It's Vismita. Well, Miss Vita, do you have the history set to Matto? Yes, sir. Yeah. Brackish water is the area where river joins the sea and it is called, it is called estuary. Estuary. Where river water joins the sea. Then, during rainy season, water flows into the sea during summer season, water flows from the sea back to the river. And that water, which flows back in the river for some time, is always referred as a brackish water. This water has a different salinity during rainy season and summer season. It is generally saline, not as fresh water as the other rivers. So the fishes, prawns, shrimps, Shrimps are of same type, just like prawn, aquatic arthropods. The fishes, prawns, shrimps, lobsters, and mollusks are of great nutritive value. If at all you have the offer of a fish, chicken, mutton, which you should prefer? Which you should prefer? Fish. Chicken, mutton. Yes, which you should go for? Can you, sir? Are you there? Aisha has come today. Aisha? Aisha. Yes, which one you'll go for? Which one you like? Now we are. Why? Now we are. 
Yes, sir. Which people go for generally? Fish. I Which is good for health? Which is good for health? Which is good for health? Come on, quick. Anyone who uses which is good for health? Good for health is the fish. But most of you go for Navya chicken. Vishwita? Yes, sir. Which one you go for? Sir, fish. Huh? Fish. No. Fish is available every day. You'll go for? Chicken, sir. Ah, you are lying, huh? <laughs> okay. So, this is what a tiger prawn you have. This is white prawn. What is it? A T. Sigidi Minu. Krill. A type of a prawn only. Or that uh, crustacean. Shrimps. Edible oyster. Another one. So these are all what you have. Clams. Koyolo. Freshwater. Or marine. Squids. Octopus. All these are cultured. So these are excellent source of protein. Always, if it will eat fish, always it is good for your health rather than chicken and mutton. You should minimize eating mutton or chicken. Maxima is going for fish. The flesh of fish is also a good source of mineral, vitamins, and unsaturated fatty acids. Okay. The diet of most of Indians is rich in carbohydrate. But to poor in protein, the fish meat is good source of protein and can check a protein malnutrition. Disorderliness or deformities because of protein malnutrition can be avoided by going for the fish meat. It has been used since ages as a protein rich diet by humans, especially in the coastal areas. As I told you, Fisheries or pisciculture is a type of aquaculture involving breeding, rearing, harvesting, preserving, transporting the aquatic animals of commercial value. Fisheries include capture fisheries, where food fishes are captured by net of one or the other type directly from their natural habitats, and culture fisheries, where fishes are bred, nursed, reared and harvested in the tanks. They are bred in the tanks, nursed, reared and harvested. So, capture fishes going to river or going to sea, putting in the nets and collecting the fishes. There are two major types of aquatic animal culture, mainly associated fin fishes and shell fishes. Fishy culture, culture fishes consists of cultivation of good fishes scientifically on commercial scale in a confined water bodies such as tanks, wells, ponds, etc. The successful farming of culture fishes require knowledge of breeding and feeding habits of fish. Four tanks, just remember this, four tanks are required for fish culture. They are hatchery tank for the fish eggs to hatch, nursery tank just to grow tiny fries, Rearing tank to make them to grow well and stocking tank just to prepare to marketing. So these are the four types of tanks that are used by the fish culturists. Eggs, which are also called fish seeds, are usually collected from natural water or through induced spawning. Induced spawning, what is that? The fishes are given some injection. After giving injection, the fishes release the gametes into water and these gametes fuse. Spawning is induced by injecting pituitary hormone like FSH and LH. The moment FSH and LH are administered to gravid, mature male and female, the very next day, the female spawns, that means it releases the eggs and males milt 
that they release the salmon and these sperms meet the eggs in the water and you know most of the fishes are known to show external fertilization these males and females are allowed to spawn in the spawning ponds after administering this uh, hormones these are the different types of uh, tank hatching hopper you can see and you have this uh, hatching hopper and this is a fish nursery see there how many acres of land is used for that fish nurseries a rearing pond just before putting them into stocking for marketing a rearing pond stocking pond when the demand comes they put it in it and collect the fishes and sell them the menu of a plant or animal origin along with the powdered oil cake powdered oil cake and a rice bran are introduced into the tank to promote the growth of a phytoplankton and in turn this increases the zooplankton growth so there are fishes to eat phytoplankton and also some eat the zooplankton the zooplankton is the natural feed for fries fries are the fishes which have just come out of the eggs not a fish fry young one tiny young one of the fishes are called fry fries grow to the size of 10 to 15 to 20 mm long and they can be transferred to a rearing pond this pond like the nursery pond should be shallow that means the light should penetrate up to the bottom about a meter in depth and can be 25 to 15 to 1 meter in uh, their uh, circumference the fries grow and attain a length of 10 to 15 cm in about to 3 months and are called fingerlings fries are very tiny creature the tiny creature they grow a little bit long of 10 to 15 cm half a foot and now they are called fingerlings paddy fish having a water column of 45 to 60 cm depth can also be used as a rearing user for rearing the fries so you can see here this is what fish egg this is a fish fry not a fried fish a young one of fry this grows later into fingerlings and this growing to later added the fingerlings are transferred to stocking tank this is the largest of all tanks in these fishes are stocked until they are ready for marketing the depth of water column can be 2 to 3 meters there are two major type of culture fishing right so now you come across what is called composite fish farming what is this composite fish farming in this fish farming the fish of different species are reared together we call it a polyculture composite fish farming is always called polyculture or mixed fish farming so here this is here fishes of a different two or more compatible species which can manage to live together of fishes of different feeding habits in the same water are made to grow which include katla rohu mrigala please remember these three fishes are very friendly fishes they always live together they don't fight for anything and they manage the show very well and the fish catchers are very happy to grow these real these three fishes very well and these three fishes are very close friends and your friendship is nothing in front of these fishes now let us see i will show you about that and this is what is called polyculture where fishes of different species different breeds are reared together it is also called compository fish farming or mixed fish farming the another one is monoculture here only one particular category of fish is reared and grown in the tank this can stop culturing a single species of a fish in a water body for example catfish a real fish and prawn shellfish these are always grown individually only one species at a time let us see this look here this is katla i think i have told about this it has a dorsal mouth this is a labio rohita terminal mouth and this has what is called a sirens mugala ventral mouth did i say about this did i say about this yes sir no hello 
Have you heard about this? No. So please remember, these three fishes are always made to grow in the same tank. Katla is placed here. Rohita, Roho is placed here. Murugala is left here. Whenever you leave these three fishes in the tank, automatically Katla always makes it a point to remain on the surface. Murugala makes it a point to go to the bottom and starts living there only. And Rohu occupies the middle column. Can anyone tell me why? Katla won't go down. Murugala won't come up. Rohu want to leave it to place. Can you tell me why? Who will tell me? Who will tell me? Hello? Anyone has the answer? I have already told you. What is that? Katla has a dorsal mouth. Please remember, in Austin's fishes, Cartier's fishes, Mouth may be, mouth may be dorsal, mouth may be terminal, mouth may be ventral. These three types of fishes are there. When the mouth is dorsal, they always look for the food from upper side, from upper side. So the, those fishes, which have dorsal mouth, they are always surface feeder. They feed whatever they say available food on the surface, surface feeders. And those which have the mouth at the tip, they are called column feeder. Column feeder. They eat whatever that is coming in front of them. And those who have the mouth on the ventral side, they are called Bottom feeders, benthic forms, bottom feeders. They eat, they eat whatever that is available. They eat whatever that is available, available in the bottom. So this fish always remains in the surface, looking for the food on the upper side. We have the dorsal mouth and this have terminal mouth. Labia Ruita, Tamil whatever comes in front, that is. And this has, this has ventral mouth, whatever is there available in the bottom, they eat. There is no fighting for the space to live. No, this got its territory here. This got in the middle of the pond or tank, and this gets restricted to the bottom. Always fighting takes place for three reasons. Whatever may be the animal. First, for the space to live. Second, for the food to eat. And the third fighting is why for why for third fighting? If both of these are met with come on. Why the fighting takes place? What is another reason? Another reason? Sarvotam. Sarvotam. Yes, sir. What is, why the animals always fight? Space to is okay. Food to eat is okay. Apart from these two, for another reason, organisms, animals fight, what may be the species? Who will tell? Namrata? Yes, sir. Do you know? Mating, sir. Ah, next is to get a mating partner. The fighting is for getting mating partner. So now they are not fighting for the space to live. They are not fighting for the food to eat because this gets food from whatever there is available from the surface. Okay. This gets the food what is available in the middle. This gets the food from the bottom. So no space, no fighting for the space to live, no fighting for the food to eat, 
do you think that they fight to get a mating partner? They fight amongst these three, fight amongst themselves to, to get a mating partner? Navya, Jayasri, Nadira, Vishwita, do they yes, fight? Sir. Who is telling? Do they fight to get a mating partner amongst these? Is there any fighting amongst these three? Katla, Ruham, Rikala for getting mating partner? Yes or no? Yes or no? No. Why? Because Why? they are mating partner. Yeah. Who said the different species? Yes, she said. Yeah. Do you? Bless you, sir. Yeah, bless you. Do you come across fighting between a dog and a cat for getting mating partner? No, sir. No. You are right, bless you. They are belong to different species. There is no fighting at all between them. So all these three always live happily and even fish culture is also happy. Okay, right? During the last few decades, enormous development in aquaculture resulted in tremendous increase in the production of fish and fish products. And you know, this is what is called blue revolution. Right? Now, the fish waste from factories processing fish food is utilized as a cattle feed. Your cattle is fed with the fish waste. And you drink a cattle milk and you tell that you are strictly vegetarian. And your cattle eats a fish weight. And fish weights are also used as fish manure. The shark liver oil, have you heard about that? Cod liver oil, another fish, cod, shark liver oil, cod liver oil are good sources of vitamin A. C and D. Fish glue is prepared from the country tissue of the head and the fins of the fishes. We can't waste the head and the fins of the fishes. Vismita, whenever you prepare fish for the food, what you do with the head? What you what, do with sir? the fins? What you do with the head and the fins of the fishes when you prepare dishes from fishes? Sir, we yeah. remove it. Huh? We remove it. He, after removing, what you do? You throw it. Am I right? No, sir. Then? Then? Sir, mommy feeds to the small, small chickens here. Okay. Mommy is very clever. She feeds to the small, small chicken. Or it is thrown, but it is not eaten, you know? Right. Okay. So it is used in the preparation of fish glue. Some sort of gum. Is in glass of commerce a silvery powder obtained from swim bladder of the fishes or air bladder fishes is used for clearing wine and beer. If this, uh, if this dried swim bladder or silvery powder of silk bladder, dried swim bladder or air bladder, if at all it is uh, put in a wine bottle or beer bottle. It makes the beer or wine very crystal clear and it gets settled, the in glass of commerce gets settled in the bottom of that. And you can pour the wine or beer from up and utilize. It will be crystal clear. Then, shag green is a leather obtained from the skin of shark. And you know, the skin of shark has, a, what is that? Posteriorly directed fins. The fish that you know, in case of Pushar, you come across a placard scale. The placard scale is a tridentist scale. It is a tridentist scale and its tip projected part is always directed back. It is directed back in the skin. If you touch this shark and move the hand from anterior to posterior region, you feel the body is quite smooth. If you move from posterior to tail region to head region, you feel, feel roughness of this. So these scales, what you have, are present in the skin. So dried skin is called shag green. 
dried skin of Sharkis for chagrin, and it is uh, in the chagrin, there's a letter obtained from the skin of Shark. The body, the body, the body of the body oil of the fish is used in the paint and the soap manufacture. The oil of the fish, body oil of the fish is used in paint making and soap manufacture. The precious pearl is obtained from the pearl oyster, pink tada, you know, pearl, which is used in preparing these uh, gold ornaments. Some of the fishes are larvivorous, which uh, eat the larva of, uh, that is gambusia fish, larva of uh, mosquitoes, they eat. So it is called uh, mosquito fish. It feeds on the larva of the mosquitoes and thereby control mosquito population. In this way, we get to different uses of fishes. And can know fish oil is applied to the outer part of the boat, boats so that it gives a protection to the wood by which this boat is made. And also you see fish row. What is this fish row? Fish row is nothing but fully ripened egg of the fishes. You can see it. These are the different eggs. These are different eggs of different fishes. All these are together form what is known as the fish row. Eggs of the fishes. Fully ripened eggs of uh, masses of fish and a certain marine animals such as a sea urchin, shrimp, etc. And there's very good demand for that. It is rich in cholesterol, rich in thymine, tyrosine, B, C, D, E, vitamin. And people always are crazy of this fish row. It is highly tasty and easily digestible. In earlier days, when our fishermen used to catch the fish, if they find that the fishes are gravy and their abdomen is swollen with the full of eggs, the fishermen used to throw such fishes back to the river, thinking that their survival makes them to get thousands of fishes in future. But nowadays, the fishermen have become very, very selfish and they know that there is good demand for this also. And they use these uh, eggs present in the gravid female just to, to prepare fish roe. It is used as a cooked ingredient in many dishes and also as a raw ingredients and people go for that. Now, this is what a shagrin always already have told you. A leather obtained by drying the skin of a shark and some rays and it is used for polishing the hard wood because of its uh, scales. Flacker scales, pointer scales are present there. These are used just like the sandpaper. They are used for polishing the hardwood. When heated and polished, shagrin is used for decorating ornaments and for covering a sword hilt also. It is handle of the swords. What these people are doing? You know, once in a year, near Hyderabad, People gather in a place to the extent of 40 to 50,000 on the previous day just to, to get a treatment for asthma the very next day morning. The, all these asthma patients waiting in queue for live fish treatment. What is done in the next day to the extent of 40 to 50,000 people assembled on the previous day night itself, sleep there itself, and in the morning they are given treatment for the asthma like this. Live fish is just to push it into their mouth and that uh, wriggles there while entering. And I don't know how it is going to create treat the asthma, but people always go for this. Okay, so that's all about this particular chapter that is the fishes. So you can have today's uh, dinner with this uh, fish fry. Okay, any doubt? Do you have any doubt? Hello? No, sir. Are you, Are you hearing me? No doubt. Right? So, one part of this uh, strategies for animal breeding, whatever, now we shall take up another part. Right? Clear? Shall you continue? So, I would like to take up now the next part. That is the plant breeding. I hope you don't have any doubt. Right? 
हेलो आयशा आयशा एनी डोंट प्लेसी चरण हर्षवर्धन जननी कविता शालू गोहेट सरोतम सिद्धेश नाउ आई यू लेट टू टेक अप द नेक्स्ट पार्ट दैट इज This is what I have. Please just to know these are different terminologies in connection with the agriculture revolution. Always you should familiar, be familiar with that. Blue revolution, fish production, concerning fish production. Brown revolution, leather production. Golden revolution, fruits or honey production. Green revolution, food grain production. Grey revolution, fertilizer production. Pink revolution. Onion production. Red revolution, meat or tomato production. Silver revolution, egg or poultry production. White revolution, milk or dairy production. Yellow revolution, oil seed production, and evergreen revolution, overall development of agriculture. Sometimes the pink revolution is also referred to as the prawn production. Okay, now we shall just to take up. This uh, plant breeding. Yes, listen very carefully. With the in the next lecture, I am going to finish this part. And uh, in my next lecture, I may take up this uh, discussion on the human health diseases. And after finishing that, I'll be taking discussion on this particular chapter. And let me put that uh, MCQs in uh, Google Meet. Now, coming to the plant breeding. Traditional farming can only yield a limited biomass as food for humans and animals. What is the tradition for me? The farming that we are using in the day to day. Earlier, not now. Prior to 1960s, people used to just use this bullock or he buffaloes just to plow the land, agricultural land, and use it to. Grow these uh, crops, but it used to give very limited yield. Better management practices and increase in uh, acreage can increase yield, but only to a limited extent. What is that? Better management practices. Even if at all you manage in a better way, it used to yield slightly, not to, to the large extent. Plant breeding as a technology has helped increase yield. To a very large extent, what is the plant breeding? Who in India has not heard of green revolution? And you know, you are not born at that time. Green revolution was responsible for our country to not merely meet the national requirements in food production, but also help us even to export it. You just ask your dad or grandfather, grandmother. When we are all going to the school, at that time also, midday meals were there. Midday meals, and you know what used to get supplied at that time. During those days, for the midday meals, your upit to used to get served. How that upit is made? What is the raw material for upitto? Hello, who will tell me? What is the raw material? What is used in your upitto? Blessing. Rava. Hello, hello, come on. Rava, sir. Rava. Rava. How that rava is made? Rava. Is it carbohydrate? Is it a protein? Is it a fat? Rava is obtained by which uh, crop? Which uh, food? Wheat, sir. Wheat. In earlier days, when we were all going to the school, rava upit was there, and this rava was made by cutting the wheat, and that to big big pieces. And you know, at that time, India used to beg America 
to provide us free wheat. They used to give us free wheat, wheat without charging anything. Otherwise, they used to throw it to the ocean and we used to beg and get that wheat. But these are all prior to Green Revolution. Once we started this, once this Green Revolution occurred, the entire scenario changed. Now we are in a position to export wheat to foreign countries. Green Revolution was dependent on, dependent to a large extent on plant breeding techniques for development of high yielding and disease resistant varieties in wheat, rice, maize, etc. You must know what is Green Revolution. It is concerned with what? Green Revolution was dependent or included plant breeding technique. So what is the advantage of that? What is plant breeding technique used to help us? Used to do the green version involved plant breeding technique for development of high yielding and disease resistant varieties. Always prior to that, the wheat, rice, maize, even though they were all grown, they never used to yield that much of high quantity. And most of them used to suffer from one or the other diseases. So Green Revolution enabled us to get varieties of wheat, rice, maize. They were not only, they had a resistance power to the diseases, but they also used to give high yield. Okay, now, what is plant breeding? Plant breeding is, plant breeding is the purposeful manipulation of a plant species in order to create desired plant types that are better suited for cultivation, give better yield, and are disease resistant. So these three are very important in plant breeding. What are they? What are they? These, these are better suited for cultivation. It should not be difficult to, to cultivate them. We could uh, seed them, we should uh, grow them easily, and they must give better yield and they should possess a disease resistance capacity. This is a resistance power. So these three are mainly aimed in plant breeding. Conventional plant breeding. Conventional plant breeding means the plant breeding which we used to follow since a time immemorial, since a long time. Conventional plant breeding has been practiced for thousands of years. Since the beginning of human civilization, recorded evidences of plant breeding dates back 9,000 to 11,000 years ago. For about the last, uh, on an average, 10,000 years, we used to follow conventional plant breeding. Conventional plant breeding is a technique that was followed by our uh, ancestors continuously for the last 10,000 years. Many present-day crops are the result of domestication in the ancient time. Whatever you have some of the crops, present day crops, many of them, they were grown since the time immemorial. But at the same time, along with that, some new crop varieties have come recently. Today, all our major food crops are derived from domesticated varieties. Now, what is this domesticated variety? From where we might have got the first, first rice variety? From where we might have gone? I am telling you now. About 10,000 years ago, we used to have this grow, growing of these wheat, rice, etc. and all. From where they might have come? Especially I am asking about the rice. Wheat is different. About the rice. You may be knowing that each and every village in our India it used to have their own variety of the rice there. And this rice, wild varieties, were available in the forest. From that, our people started cultivating, hybridizing, and having some domesticated varieties. Classical plant breeding involves crossing or hybridization for pure life followed by artificial selection to produce plants with the desirable traits of higher yield, nutrition, and resistance to disease. So what was done? Even earlier, 
before this green revolution people used to grow this uh, different varieties of uh, crops at that time they used to follow crossing or hybridization of uh, pure varieties and they also used to select the plants of uh, desirable trait desirable trait means whatever we want we used to go for that particular variety in which we wanted to get whatever we wanted to or whatever we desired to get and that means generally higher yield and new disease resistance with the advancement in genetics molecular biology tissue culture etc et et plant breeding is now increasingly being carried out by using molecular genetics tools that we are going to study later in some other chapter if you have to list the traits or characters that the breeders have tried to incorporate into crop plants if we were to list now we have to list which one are most important for the farmers what all the traits characters they look for in their crop plant the first we would list would be increase the crop yield and improve the quality always we want quality wise quantity wise both we wanted the one which gives high yield and better quality improved quality we want they should be good in taste not only good in the yield but also in good in taste so increase the tolerance increase the tolerance increase the tolerance increase the tolerance to environmental stresses like salinity extreme temperatures drought etc resistance to pathogens like viruses fungi bacteria and increase the tolerance to insect pests would be on our list to first thing that we look into that is the quantum of production quantity second one we look into is the quality third one that we look into that increase the tolerance to environmental stresses like high temperature lack of water salinity etc and also in addition to resistance to disease causing organisms pathogens and increase the tolerance to insect pest in each and every crop is yes, one or the other pest insect pest would be on our list to do. so these are the criteria every farmer look into whenever he grows any crop plant breeding progress are carried out in a systematic way throughout the world in government institutions and commercial companies the main steps we are going to study now okay now prior to this i have the question now okay right i have the question now what is the question okay i would like to ask the question to siddesh 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 yes, okay you please tell me what a farmer looks into whenever he wants to grow a crop climate pardon right climate sir no i am asking you now a crop a farmer he wants to get a good he wants to grow a crop what all his priorities what he looks into that what all he want to get from that now he has to he should get a good deal sir from no he should get good deal sir from yeah one one then what else vishwas vishwas prophet sir that is true but what i wanted i have listed some of the important points when a farmer wants to grow a crop lohit this is the best to plant pardon this is the best to plant okay one apart from that that is one point apart from that who will tell me
Who will tell me? Come on. They should have tolerance for mental stresses. Okay. Suitable for cultivation. Okay. Distance to fat version. Okay. Quality of crop. Okay. Tolerance to infection of pesticides. Nadira? Increase the tolerance to infection of pesticides. Okay. Okay. Then. Namrata? Yes, sir. Come on, tell me. Improved quality, sir. Okay, then. High crop yield, sir. Yeah, that is the most important thing. Every farmer first looks into high yield should be there. Along with that, it should have good quality. That means it should be tasteful. Next to that, next to that, it should grow well in the adverse environment condition like high temperature drought condition salinity condition then then it should be easy to cultivate then it should have resistance to pathogens like viruses bacteria fungi then 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 the more important thing yes sri Tolerance to insect and pest. Tolerance to insect pest. This is the most important. Please remember, in nature, for each and every crop, there is one insect pest. For each and every crop, there is one insect pest. It may be insect pest, or it may be some worms, helminthus. So, you always come across whenever you grow some uh, crops. Generally, especially vegetable crops, you come across either root borer or stem borer or leaf borer or flower borer or fruit borer. One or the other borer, worm will be there. One or the other insect pest will be there. And these insect pests, they start damaging one or the other parts of the plants. So all these, the farmer will look at that before going for a crop. Understood? So I want every one of you to listen to the lecture very carefully. Lohit, you are not, you are not hearing the class properly. Understood? Manasitto Pata Kelabeko, you must listen to the lecture properly. Right? Now coming back. So this is what I said. Crop yield, improved quality, increase the tolerance to environment stresses, resistance to pathogens, increase the tolerance to insect pest would be on our list too. Plant breeding involves many steps. The main steps in the breeding a new genetic variety of a crop are very, very important for four months or five months question. Collection of variability. What is meant by this? Collection of variability. Genetic variability is the root of any breeding program. What is that genetic variability? Genetically, they are different. When they are different genetically, when the genes are different, that will be having different types of phenotype, that will be having different types of taste. In many crops, Pre-existing genetic variability is available from wide varieties of the wide relatives of the crop. For many crops, pre-existing genetic variability, that means having different varieties of that, that particular crop, is available from wide relatives of the crop. From where you get wide relatives? Where you find these wide relatives of the crop? Where? 
where you come across wild relatives of the crop wild relatives of the crop are found in the nature now you know you have turda what is that turda what is that turda turda have heard about turda yes you don't know what is turda anyone togri bele togri bele in kannada if you look at the togri bele whatever turda you have if at all you go to forest you will find wild relative of turda you will find wild relatives of rice you will find wild relatives of brinjal in this way for many crops pre existing genetic variability is available from wild relatives of the crop or these crops it is not that all this they should be wild relatives so should be there in the forest they should be, they may be seen wild relative in the nature in the elaters which are generally grown in the nature collection and preservation of all the different wild varieties now for example now for example you wanted to get wild relatives of the rice if you go to different parts of our country you will get a different 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 varieties of rice many of the varieties are seen in that particular village only that particular village only for example now you know as per the brinjal is concerned there is a brinjal very famous brinjal very tasteful brinjal where this very tasteful famous big sized brinjal is available vishwita vishwita yes sir where it is where it is available you don't know what so is brinjal is yeah vishwita is from a place called mattu about 10 km from udupi and in that mattu there is one badalekai it is called mattu gulla it is called mattu gulla and it is famous in the world best variety of brinjal available and this mattu gulla is available only in her village nowhere in the world in any other place so this is a wild variety so like that there will be some have you heard about siddesh harshavardhan vishwas have you heard about the badagi menasu yes sir yes sir yeah yes sir this is grown in that particular place it is a wild variety available there only so in this way we have number of different varieties of each and every crop in different parts of the country or state collection and preservation of all the different wild varieties species and the relatives of the cultivated species is a free requisite for effective exploitation of natural genes available in the population now what you have to do now let us see that you wanted to get one you wanted to develop genetically one best variety of rice what is best variety of rice should have whether this rice should have tall stem or short stem whether it should have whatever that fruit you get whether that fruit should be sufficiently that more in quantum when you want to get the best variety of rice first thing that you do is that you go on finding out what all varieties are available say in karnataka okay now 
this uh, this let us let us hope that you don't uh, understand this rice or you may not know you know now let us see that you wanted to now get a genetically a very good mango okay what you expect in that uh, mango you expect in this particular variety what you should be very tasteful then come on you tell me what all you expect what all you want any mango you wanted to get a good variety mango what all you expect come and tell me navya what do you want come on navya are you there no can you are you there hello hello whether you people are there yes sir who will tell me now <clears throat> i we want to get one best variety what all you look for in this best variety anyone tell me quality what all pardon quality quality wise means you should be good in taste then uh, size you should be good well. it should size. be big in size then it's a seed should be too, too small quite small more pulpy more pulpy and it's a uh, epicarp whatever that have it should be it should be thin and tasteful edible am i right am i right is sufficient is it sufficient and it should it should start the ripening very quickly and it should be available throughout the year if at all you are looking for all these qualities in a mango you wanted to get a crop like that so for that first of all you should make and also that the tree should not be you should not go very high it should be within the reach of your hand am i right am i right am i right okay if you feel that these are all the qualities which you are expecting in your crop now you are going to collect the all wide varieties one the tree which is always growing very short and easily you can pluck the fruit to the mango which is very tasteful another variety you are looking into another plant you are going to look into which is with the big size of mango like this so different different qualities all they are brought to together this is what is done first so collection and preservation of all the different wide varieties species and the relatives of the cultured species followed by their evaluation for their capacity is a prerequisite for effective exploitation of natural gene available in the population first you should know which particular species of the mango gives you big fruit second you should know which particular species of the mango gives you very tasteful fruit now you want to combine that to two you wanted to cross them you wanted to get a tasteful you may be having one particular variety very quite tasteful but the mangoes are quite small you know sometimes it comes to the market quite a small mangoes it's quite small and if you don't eat it will be very much tasteful very tasteful just like your sugar or jaggery that was sweet but it's quite small and in some of the mango you might have seen a quite a small and its a seed is very small very flat have you eaten such a mango namrata namrata yes sir do you like mango yes sir do you like mango or jackfruit or both i like both sir both so have you seen mango is a small mango with a flat seed even its uh, uh, skin is very thin and you can eat that also and even you can't eat the seed others you would have eaten seed also am i right yes sir have you tasted such mango 
Now, you wanted to develop a mango with the same taste, but not a small fruit like that, but you should be a big one. So, in this way, what all qualities we are looking for? All wide varieties are collected. Just to know what genes are present, which type of genes are present in which particular fruit. Have you understood this point, Harshavardhan? Sitesh? Yes, sir. Did you follow my point? Yes, sir. This is what is called germplasm collection. The entire collection of plants or seeds having all the diverse alleles for all genes in a given crop is called germplasm collection. Please remember, you will not get all the qualities, whatever you are looking for, in one particular plant. In one of the variety, the fruit is quite tasteful, but small in size. Another variety, the fruit is big, but no taste. Another variety, the fruit, the trees are growing very short, but it is not giving very good food, very good fruit. So in this way, all the different qualities, what we have, we are pulling all these mango plants together. Then we have to cross. So first thing is that germplasm collection. Have you understood this? Nadira, Blessi, Jayasri, Kavita, have you understood what I am telling now? Have you understood? Please answer, I say. Are you not hearing me? I feel bad if you don't answer. Yes, sir. Hello? Yes, sir. Why that you people take this much of time? Are you there? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Or, or, kept, or kept this uh, mic and went out? Kept your video open and went out? So this is what a germplasm collection. Germplasm collection means collecting the genes pertain to one particular crop, one particular particular variety from all different, different, different places. So, the collection and the preservation of all the different wide varieties is a prerequisite, which is called germplasm collection. Now, evaluation and selection periods. What quality you are looking for? I hope, I want to know, how many of you understood that whatever you said just now, germplasm collection, please raise your hand. Have you understood? If you have understood, please raise your hand. Quick. There is option for the raising hand. Others have to think that you are not there. I am not seeing any hands up here. Aisha, you are not there. Aisha, Brissi, Charan, Chinmay, Rafa. Sir, I got disconnected in between. What disconnected? Brissi, you did not raise your hand. Raise my Charan, hand, sir. I raised my hand, sir. Uh, you raised it now. But I'm seeing here. Yeah. Vishmita, are you there? Yes, sir. Why you did not raise your hand? Siddesh, Sarotam, Rakesh. Raise your hand, sir. Who? Raise your hand, sir. The list is below, sir. Harshivardhan? Harshivardhan? Yes, sir. Are you there? Yes, sir. Why that your hands are not coming first and then when I ask you, then only it is coming? Now you tell me now, okay. Rakesh? Yes, sir. Answer my question. What is that? What question I did put? No, sir. Huh? 
I ask you some question. What is the answer for that? What is a germ plasm collection? Tell me. Rakesh. Correction of the various uh, uh, variation of uh, variability of the crop. Uh, which example I used to tell now? Mango. About the mango. Mango. Okay, this is what is required. So, if we want to get one good variety of mango, we must see that with all qualities, desirable qualities. You are now thinking of getting a big mango, tasteful mango, where even you can eat the outermost covering, pericarp, and also you should have very good uh, fresh misocar, and you should be in a position to uh, reach it within a short height. All these qualities, if at all you want to develop, you must first know what all varieties of mango are available in your place. This is what requirement. This is known as germplasm collection. Evaluation and selection of parents. The germplasm is evaluated so as to identify plants with the desirable combination character. We want to combine all these characters. So, short height, taste, big size, available for most of the time. The selected plants are multiplied and used in the process of hybridization. The what are the selected plants you have brought? They are multiplied, they are made to grow more and more. They are multiplied and used in the process of hybridization. Pure lines are created wherever desirable and possible. As far as possible, we make the pure line because the tumor should become very easy to cross these two. So we are now making whatever we are interested, that particular variety is available as far as possible. Pure, what do you mean by pure line? If at all you want to get a tasteful, you must get that. All the generations are developed afterwards, it is a tasteful only. There is nothing like that, some are less tasteful, some are more tasteful, like nothing like that. And this, all whatever is done, please remember, it takes years together, not only within one year, all this you can finish, no. Right? Pure lines are created whenever desirable and possible. So this is second. Third, cross hybridization among the selective parents. The desired characters have very often to be combined from two different plants. For example, high protein quality of one parent may need to be combined with the disease registration from another parent. Now, you are, you are getting one variety which has very good protein quality, but it has no resistance to disease power, diseases. Another one, you find a plant with a poor protein quality, but it has very good disease resistance. Now, these two, two plants are crossed to see that we are getting a variety which possesses, which possesses or which you should possess. Come on, tell me what? Anyone? Come on. You continue my sentence so that I can make sure that you are listening to me. Lohit? 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 Lohit, 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 are you not hearing me? Unmute yourself. Who will tell me? I have said, I have just said one sentence. Complete the sentence. Who will do it? Who will do it? We wanted one variety. I said, one variety has a disease resistance. Another variety has a high protein quality. High protein quality is with the poor disease resistance. The one with the poor disease resistance has a high quality protein. What we want to do? We want you to get variety with the high quantity protein, high quality protein and disease resistance together. Are you following me? Yes? I shall stop it here and let me continue this lecture in the next week. Okay? Right? 
So be attentive in the classroom.